Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 25, The Reforms of Solon. In the early 6th century BC, economic, political, and social conditions at Athens were exasperated by a severe agrarian crisis that ravaged the Attic countryside. The rich responded in a typical manner, by tightening the screws on the poor tenant farmers, driving them further into poverty. Making matters worse, the wealthy landlords routinely exported grain to other profitable markets, thus further straining the food capabilities of Attica. At the same time, the Athenians casted about for more good arable farmland and soon fixed their gaze on the nearby island of Salamis. After digging through the ancient texts and conveniently verifying their rightful historical claim to the island, Athens conquered Salamis and populated it with Athenians. It was not an Apoikia, but instead a Kleruki, an extension of Attica. This was the first occasion of the physical expansion of the Athenian polis. This angered Megara, although they had no official control of it, and those two polis would continue to be at war with one another. Although the Athenians believed that this conflict would be brief, it was Megara who emerged victorious. Because of the poor soil of Attica, the Athenians could not raise enough grain to feed their increasing population. Consequently, they bartered crops suited to their land, olives, vines, figs and barley, abroad for wheat. High-quality olive oil, packaged in vases, made from the excellent clay of Attica, was their most significant export, much of it going to the Black Sea region, which came to supply a great deal of the wheat consumed in Attica. Athens fought fiercely to defend the routes that led to the Black Sea. This led them into conflict with Mytilene, as described in episode 19, over Sigeon in the Troad near the mouth of the Hellespont. Ultimately, Sigeon was awarded to Athens by Periander, the tyrant of Corinth, who acted as an arbitrator in this dispute. The position of Sigeon would be critical for grain and commercial opportunities as Athens developed economically. But although Athens had a great potential for economic development, many poor sharecroppers were losing the struggle to survive. So for a second time, the Athenians turned to a respected individual to resolve the crisis. According to Aristotle, the civil strife between the Gnoramoi, or notables, as he puts it, and the multitude, the plethos, had reached such a pitch that both sides were willing to appoint a man named Solon as a mediator to resolve the economic and political crisis before it inevitably led to tyranny, as was the case with so many of their neighbors. Solon flourished in the late 7th and early 6th centuries BC. He was the first Greek poet to write anything about himself, that we have at least. Only 285 of his lines have survived, but we do have Herodotus, Aristotle's Constitution of Athens, and Plutarch's Life of Solon. He was considered one of the seven sages of the Archaic period, and for those keeping track, he is the seventh and final sage that we will discuss. Lots of stories were attached to him later, because he was a prominent figure that everyone had heard about, so it is hard to figure out what is true and what is not. According to tradition, he was a man of moderate means, but gained his wealth through commerce as he traveled far and wide on his own merchant ship, educating himself and making money. Other sources say that he was born a wealthy noble from the Medontidae royal family and only traveled to learn, rather than make money. Regardless, his poems show that he was rich enough to know how to write, but also knew how to write to all of the social classes, which led to the contradictory stories about his birth. He had to have been a nobleman, because nobody else would have been able to gain such esteem but his poem sent out propaganda that he was a man who the middleman could relate to as well. By his traditional date for appointment to Sol Archon in 594-593 BC, Solon had gained a notorious reputation. Solon had gained much popularity during Athens' continuous war against the Megarians over Salamis, who, as we have seen, were very bitter about the Athenians possessing the island. After repeated disasters, Solon was able to increase the morale of his troops on the strength of a poem that he wrote about Salamis. According to Plutarch, he and his cousin, Pisistratus, more on him later, defeated the Megarians, either by means of a cunning trick, or more directly through heroic battle, sometime around 595 BC. The popular account of his campaign is that he and Pisistratus sailed to Cape Coleus, 
near Phaleron, where they found all the women of Athens there performing a customary sacrifice to Demeter. Solon therefore sent a trusty man to Salamis, who pretended to be a deserter, and bade the Megarians that if they wished to capture the Athenian women, they were theirs for the taking. Meanwhile, Solon had ordered the women to withdraw, and instead replaced them with young men, who were beardless, and dressed as women. They concealed daggers underneath their garments. When the Megarians disembarked and approached them, the young men pulled out their daggers and hacked them all to death. The Athenians at once set sail and retook possession of the island. Other sources say that he and Pisistratus engaged the Megarians on land, while a fleet of ships simultaneously defeated the Megarians at the sea, and thus recaptured the island that way. Regardless, the result was that Megara had lost the island. The Megarians, however, refused to give up their claim to the island. The dispute was referred to the Spartans, who eventually awarded possession of the island to Athens on the strength of the case that Solon put forth to them, that being that Salamis was an Athenian possession in Homer. This actually wasn't the case, as Solon read aloud his own version of the catalog of ships at the trial. At this time, an official version of Homer hadn't been codified yet. Regardless, it worked, and once again, we see the power that the Iliad had in the Greek world. Furthermore, Solon also used as evidence Pythian oracles that had spoke of Salamis as being Ionian and not Dorian, like Megara. These events made Solon very famous and powerful, not only in Athens, but the Greek world. His popularity was only further increased when he argued that the Greeks must come to the aid of Delphi in the First Sacred War which also began in 595 BC. Aristotle reports that it was because of this persuasion that the Amphictyons undertook the war. However, Solon did not lead the Athenian contingent. Instead, it was a man named Alcmion. He was the son of Megacles of the Alcmionidae, who had been driven out of the city after the curse was attached to them. It is not stated why this exiled family clan was chosen to lead the Athenian forces. Regardless, they were, and as we will see shortly, it would be critical for their family's future success. In any event, Pausanias reports that Solon joined the Athenian army and even came up with the idea to add the Hellebore to the Plestis River that then poisoned the inhabitants of Kira and brought the first sacred war to a close. But this seems to be a later invention. Anyway, if you want to know more about this war, we went into it in more detail in episode 16. According to Plutarch, Solon was temporarily awarded autocratic powers by the Athenian citizens on the grounds that he had the wisdom to sort out their differences for them in a peaceful and equitable manner. According to Aristotle and Plutarch, he obtained these powers when he was appointed to Sol Archon. Some modern scholars believe these powers, in fact, were granted some years after Solon had been Archon, when he would have been a member of the Areopagus and probably a more respected statesman by his aristocratic reforms. Regardless, whether it was in 593 or the early 580s BC, he was given sole power in order to reform the Athenian constitution and establish a reign of eunomia, or good law, in large part to the crisis that involved the many Athenians who had been enslaved in Attica and sold abroad. Solon says that some had been there for so long that they forgot the Athenian language, so it must have been steadily increasing for generations. This really rubbed some people the wrong way. Slavery was one thing. Nobody was against it in Greece. But the enslavement of fellow Athenians was thought to be wrong. Their pressure to do something about it was twofold. Although the Athenians were somewhat bothered with the suffering of their own people, most of the pressure came from Megara, Corinth, and Sicyon, their neighbors next door. When things had been bad socially in those polis, a tyranny was established. The Athenians were so terrified that this would happen to them that they were so desperate to stop it. Thus, they instituted a reform. They decided to select one Athenian from among themselves who would replace all nine archons and be the sole authority for one year. He would be allowed to legislate for the Athenians as a way out of the problem, since it is very hard to get a council to do something drastic when so many people have so many different ideas. This was extraordinary because there is no precedent. They chose Solon because he was competent, intelligent, wise, and fair. More importantly, He was the one man least implicated, since he was neither associated with the rich and their injustice, nor was he involved in the necessities of the poor. Not surprising, the reforms he imposed were moderate. Also, the Delphic Oracle was at the height of its influence right now, sending out messages of Sophrosyne, 
meaning self-control and moderation. So Solon was promoting a powerful way of thinking for the time. Solon's laws, known as the Sesak Thea, or the shaking off of burdens, supplanted those of Draco, except for his laws on homicide, and weakened the Eupatridae monopoly of the magistracies and the council of the Areopagus. Like those of Draco, Solon's laws were inscribed on large wooden slabs and stood upright for the people to see, before being later carved in stone. Both Pausanias and Plutarch report to have seen these laws. However, today the only records we have are fragmentary quotes and comments in later literary sources. Although the earliest surviving sources for Solon's reforms, aside from his own poems, were written centuries later by Aristotle and Plutarch, the outlines of his reform program can still be reconstructed. These two sources individually do not give a full account, but a combination of both plausibly suggests that he had three major reform programs, economic, political, and legal. Aristotle records that Solon's first act was to address the sufferings of the poor. Instead of making the usual declaration made by the archons when coming into office, which is that he would protect the property of all men undiminished, he reversed course and set the people free, both in the present and the future, by abolishing the use of debt slavery and forbidding loans secured by debt servitude, but not the institution of slavery itself because he had no problem with Athenians enslaving non-Athenians. Regardless, Solon made it retroactive to liberate all current Hectomoroi by removing the Horai. They regained full possession of their land, thus adding substantially to the class of small landowners, and were the main beneficiaries of his economic reforms. Because if there was any doubt before, if you subscribe to the serfdom theory, that is, the newly freed former Hectomoroi were now without question the legitimate owners of the land. Solon also somehow tracked down those who had been sold abroad or had fled into exile and brought them back into Attica. These Athenians would have been those identified by Aristotle as Agogamoi, or the Hectomoroi, who had failed to pay their one-sixth debt and became borrowers who had used their own person as security. We don't quite know how he managed to do this, though, but Solon did allow the wealthy to keep the land that they had already seized as their own, and thus did not give it back to those former slaves who had been freed and came back from abroad, only to the Hectomoroi who were already living on the land. Also, we should note that he did not cancel all debts, just those from debt servitude. This is what the lower classes clamored for, as well as a redistribution of the land, as it was disproportionately owned by the wealthy. Solon, though, held steadfast and refused to do these things because it would have meant civil war, as the wealthy were not going to give up their land without a fight. In doing what he did, Solon took the moderate stance. He settled the crisis momentarily, but did not guarantee that it would not reappear later, because moderate reforms usually mean unsatisfactory reforms. All of this was not done for altruistic reasons but because Solon wanted to re-establish a strong, free peasant base upon which the continuing strength and prosperity of Athens depended for future success. Although the abolition of debt slavery and the cancellation of servitude debts provided immediate economic relief, Solon's reforms did not remove all of the financial problems of the poor. The poorest of the former Hectomoroi, even with full possession of produce, and those who had been previously forced through poverty to become debt bondsmen still faced the same difficulties of trying to make an adequate living for themselves and their families. Such men now found it harder to borrow since they could no longer offer their own self as reliable security for their debt, and because creditors were weary of lending, having already suffered under one cancellation of debts. They were angry at Solon's refusal to redistribute the land which was in their opinion the ideal long-term solution for their economic plight. Therefore, although now free in the eyes of the law, many were forced to seek the patronage of the rich, and thus became their dependents, which became a source of physical strength for the politically ambitious aristocrats, but a destabilizing force within the state in the years that followed Solon's archonship. However, Solon's economic reforms had long-term objectives and were designed to create a future prosperity for Athens by removing the causes that had produced the current economic crisis and would produce again if changes were not made. Thus, Solon's other economic measures were less drastic in the short term, but equally as important. 
He maintained the system of family tenure of land through inalienability of land and encouraged the use of the marginal land to produce cash crops, like olive oil and wine. He prohibited grain from being exported, even lowering the price because it was needed at home. Only olive oil was permitted to be exported. He also seems to have realized that since all the best sites for colonies had now been taken, Athens would have to produce more goods for export in order to accumulate more grain for a larger population. This is probably why he encouraged the emigration of artisans to Athens by opening up citizenship to those who wished to settle permanently and showed that they had some valuable craft. The result was that Athens became a great center for the manufacture of great things, such as painted pottery and sculpture. Previously, you had to have an Athenian father in order to receive citizenship. These people would have been called metoikois, or metics, or resident aliens, and they did not have access to the legal system, politics, or medicine. Now these people were not medics, which also had no precedent. The long-term result of all of this was threefold. First, it encouraged farmers to concentrate on olive oil production, which was Athens' most lucrative agricultural export. Second, it encouraged those who had capital to invest in craft manufacture. Third, the growth of an industrial base in Athens provided alternative employment for those who could no longer make an adequate living from agriculture. Solon also changed the Athenian system of weights and measures from the Phaedonian standard to the Euboean standard, which facilitated trade better with the Aegean and the East, since that was where they were beginning to exploit. It also reduced their dependence on Againa, Athens' arch enemy. The Euboean standard was also employed by Corinth and thus provided a bigger outlet for Athenian manufactured goods in their markets, especially Sicily and southern Italy. Supporting evidence from this comes from the distribution of Athenian black figure pottery, which in the early 6th century BC is found abundantly in various sites on the Greek mainland, the Black Sea, the eastern Aegean, and along the trade routes to the west. Aristotle reports that Solon initiated reforms to Athenian coinage, but that can be dismissed as coins were not minted in Athens until a generation after Solon. However, the later coins took their names from the original weights of silver, and it is in this fact that may have led Aristotle to associate Solon's reforms of weights and measures with a change in the coinage. As an aside, the first medic known on the historical record to have received the privileges of Athenian citizenship was a Scythian philosopher named Anacharsis who traveled from his homeland on the northern shores of the Black Sea to Athens in the early 6th century BC. He made a great impression as a forthright, outspoken barbarian, whose conversational style was so frank that the Athenians came to call such speech as Scythian discourse. Reputedly a forerunner of the Cynics, none of his works has survived. He was said to have written a book comparing the laws of the Scythians with those of the Greeks. According to tradition, he arrived in Athens while Solon was occupied with his legislative measures. When he arrived at Solon's house, he said that he had traveled from afar to make him his friend, to which Solon replied that it is better to make friends at home. Anacharsis then replied that it is necessary for Solon, who is now at home, to make friends with him. Solon laughed at his wit and accepted him as a friend. The two developed a close relationship. He arrived while Solon was in the midst of compiling his laws. After learning what Solon was doing, Anacharsis laughed at him for thinking that he could check the injustice and rapacity of the citizens with written laws. He said, They are just like spiders' webs. They would hold the weak and delicate who might be caught in their meshes, but would be torn in pieces by the rich and the powerful. Just like his new friend, Anacharsis exhorted moderation in everything. Diogenes Laertes reports that he said, The vine bears three clusters of grapes, the first pleasure, the second drunkenness, and the third disgust. Plutarch remarks that he expressed wonder at the fact that in Greece, wise men spoke and fools decided. He was said to have been initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries, a privilege denied to those who do not speak fluent Greek. According to Herodotus, when he returned to the Scythians, he was killed by his own brother for his Greek ways. In any event, although Solon's economic reforms were essential in order to remove the immediate danger of the crisis turning into revolution, he realized that the only hope for long-term stability in Athens was a reform of the constitution in which political power was shared equally. 
So Solon sought to deal with the grievances of the hoplite middle class, which resented that for too long, Athenian politics had been the exclusive province of the Eupatridae, and thus was shackled by their narrow self-interest. Recognizing this, Solon changed the structure of Athenian society to be based on wealth, not on birth. However, Solon did not merely open up the top political posts to a wider spectrum of the rich, but instead radically reorganized the entire political structure on the basis of economic status. In his new system, one's economic status was measured through agricultural produce, called medimnos, which is approximately 12 gallons. The whole people were divided up into four property classes. At the top of the scale, he created a brand new class, which he called Pentacasio medimnoi, or those whose land produced at least 500 medimnoi. Any combination of oil, wine, or grain would do. The other three classes kept their same names that predated Solon, as they had represented the military organization of Athens. The Hippes, or horsemen, were those who could afford to keep a horse for the cavalry, and they produced between 300 and 499 medimnoi. The Zugatai represented the hoplite class and were those who could afford to own a team of oxen and produced between 200 and 299 medimnoi. The Thates were the light infantrymen and thus were the poor farmers and landless workers who produced between 0 and 199 medimnoi. It is important to note that income was calculated only in terms of produce from the land. It was not until much later that a money equivalent was added for the capital from trade came ultimately from the land, and the most reliable investment for the profits of trade was still land. Solon's innovation separated out the richest citizens from the hippies as a new class and defined precisely in economic terms the specific qualifications for each class. This precision was vital for his division of political power, as each class would have a political function within his new constitution. The offices of state were thus divided among the top three classes. The post of treasurers of Athens was reserved for the top class only, presumably on the grounds that their immense personal wealth would provide less temptation to defraud the state, and those who did would have the means to repay. Only the first two classes were able to hold the nine archonships. The top three classes were eligible for the post of politi, or those who supervised public contracts and taxation, and sold confiscated property. The eleven, or those who were in charge of the state prison and were the public executioners, and the kolokreti, or those who exercised some financial functions. Solon's replacement of aristocratic birth with wealth as the qualification for holding public office was designed to satisfy the political ambitions of the wealthy non nobles. As we have discussed, the deliberate exclusion of wealthy entrepreneurs from political power in Corinth had been one of the reasons for the overthrow of the aristocratic Bacchiaidae and the establishment of the Sipsilist tyranny. Thus, Solon's solution sought to curtail the same happening in Athens. The immediate significance of the change in the qualification for office depends on the number of wealthy men at that time who were not Eupatridae, and we have no means of knowing this number. Regardless, even if this number was minuscule at this time, the number of wealthy non eupatridae would grow and an important principle had been established. Solon also introduced the Council of 400, called the Boule, which was distinct from the Areopagus. Aristotle does not specify the method of election or which classes were eligible for membership, but its members may have been chosen by lot among the three top classes. It is reasonable to presume that the Thates were excluded, but allowed the hoplite class Zugatai to be included in this new council. We are unsure what the new powers of the Boule were, because it never was put into effect, but it probably would have been considerable. As with its counterpart in classical Athens, it is very possible that the main function of the archaic Boule of 400 was pro-Bouletic, meaning it held a preliminary discussion of all topics to be placed on the agenda of the Ecclesia, or the Assembly. If so, it was clearly intended to be a counterbalance to the power of the Areopagus, whose ranks for some years to come would still be filled with the majority of the Eupatridae. Plutarch writes that Solon thought that the city with its two councils, moored, so to speak, like a ship with two anchors, would be less tossed about on the sea. 
This provision that all business for the ecclesia had to be discussed first by the Boulet of 400 was probably designed to be a stabilizing factor in the Constitution. This prevented the ecclesia from being hastily summoned with little warning and acted as a check, not only on the Areopagus and the Archons, from exerting excessive influence at sparsely attended meetings, but also on the people from passing ill-advised motions which had not been properly considered. In an even bolder move, Aristotle reports that Solon allowed the lowest class, the Thetes, admitted into the ecclesia and the law courts. There certainly was a people's assembly previously, since they would have had to go to them when they wanted to go to war. So it seems reasonable that the Thetes had probably been allowed to attend the ecclesia before Solon's reforms, but this was based on custom, and now it was written in law. However, the right of discussion was probably non-existent. Voting in favor of or against a motion was almost certainly the only political right that the Thetes had. Although the Thetes were not allowed to speak in the ecclesia, they did have the power to elect city officials and thus hold them accountable for all of their actions. What this system did was simultaneously preserve some of the old privileges while allowing for social mobility for entrepreneurial citizens who bettered their lot. Aristotle reports that he saw a dedicatory statue on the Acropolis from one man who did such as this. It said, Anthemion, son of Diphilus, set up this dedication to the gods on having risen from the Thetic class to the class of the knights. Thus, Solon replaced a standard of inheritance, or elite genes, with a system that reorganized the new economic realities of archaic Greece and created a political and social system that was far more open to individual initiative and change than that found at Sparta. Solon, though, balanced these reforms that had favored the people by granting broader powers to the Areopagus. Under Solon, the composition and authority of the Council of the Areopagus were altered when the archonship was open to all, with certain property qualifications, and the boule was created. Nevertheless, it retained the authority to decide cases of murder, and as Aristotle writes, the duty of guarding the laws, perhaps a legislative veto, just as it had existed before as overseer of the politeia, the constitution. And it was this council that kept watch over the greatest number and the most important affairs of state, in particular, correcting offenders with sovereign powers, both to fine and punish, and making returns of its expenditures without adding a statement of the reason for the outlay, and trying persons that conspired to put down the people. Solon, having laid down a law of ice angelia, or impeachment, in regard to them. Solon probably expected the Areopagus to use its new power to protect his reforms. Solon's legal reform program marked a major change in the administration of law. Previously, only the injured party could seek justice and compensation before an Athenian magistrate by bringing a DK, usually meaning justice but in this sense, it means a private prosecution. If for any reason they could not bring the case forward, there was no way that they could seek legal redress. Solon, though, saw the problem in this and realized that certain crimes affected not only the wronged individual, but also the public interest. So he created the graphe, or a written charge of indictment, which allowed any citizen to secure justice for any wrongs done to himself or others by prosecuting on behalf of the state. Furthermore, the word graphe came to be used for any public prosecution. The right of any citizen, not just the wronged person or their family, to seek legal redress in the courts marks a fundamental change in Athenian law. Public prosecution was now considered to be a more fair system for delivering justice in certain matters than private arbitration, which was conducted by a magistrate and only involved the parties in dispute. Plutarch writes that when Solon was asked what city was best of all to live in, Solon replied, The one in which those who are not wronged, no less than those who are wronged, denounce and punish the offenders. Solon also established the Hylaiae, or Court of Appeals. Prior, every magistrate had his own court, and his decision was final. But the Hylaiae now could overturn those, but not the decisions of the Areopagus, though. Some scholars have argued that in actuality, there was no right of appeal from a magistrate's judgment as long as his imposed penalty was within reasonable limits for the crime. 
The majority of scholars, though, have argued that while this may have been the case for some minor cases, Solon, in fact, granted any dissatisfied defendant the right of appeal to the Heliae, which then conducted a retrial and passed its own judgment that overruled that of the magistrate. Both Aristotle and Plutarch confirmed the latter, and there is every reason to have faith in the accuracy of their account. Furthermore, some scholars believe that Solon also established the concept of the jury, but there is little knowledge of how it worked until the classical period. The Heliae could possibly have simply been the ecclesia, or some representative portion of it, sitting as a jury. If this option was open to everyone, this would have been one of the most radical elements of Solon's reforms. However, some scholars have doubted whether Solon actually included the Thetes in this endeavor, because this would have been too bold a move for any aristocrat to make in the archaic period. What is indisputable, though, is the fact that this reform, for the first time, made the aristocratic magistrates accountable to the Athenian people for their legal decisions, and established a role for the people in the legal system. Thus, it marked the first stage in the development of the people's control over the legal system that culminated in the reforms of the classical period. In fact, Aristotle and Plutarch both saw in the Heliae the ancestor of the people's courts of the fully developed Athenian democracy when all the judicial decisions had passed from the magistrate to the jurors. Certain scholars believe that Solon was the founding father of Athenian democracy. Those who believe this argue that he sought to preserve the power from the hatred of the oppressed, wanting to protect both sides from gaining the advantage of the other. Solon's laws were set up in the Agora where everyone could see them, although most could not read them. Regardless, his written legal code on public display granted freedom, legal protection, and political access to the poor while restricting office to the wealthy elite. Thus, his constitution was rather moderate. However, he did initiate some important steps towards a democracy. Aristotle considered the prohibition of loans secured on the person, the graphe, and the right of appeal to the law courts as the three most democratic features of Solon's constitution. Regardless, Solon's most revolutionary contribution to the Athenian political system probably was his insistence that any male citizen, whatever his rank, not just the victim or the victim's relatives, could bring an indictment if he believed a crime had been committed. Once the concern of families, justice was now the business of the community as a whole. Solon's legal reforms would have been less effective if he had not also replaced the narrow, harsh law code of Draco with a comprehensive, sophisticated body of laws that embraced the many complex areas of human experience. Solon did not alter Draco's homicide laws, but he reduced the penalties for other crimes and decreed an amnesty for those who were exiled for crimes other than homicide or attempted tyranny, restoring full citizenship back to them. Apart from the obvious criminal and political laws, he dealt with private life quite a bit. They ranged from public morality, such as adultery, speaking ill of the dead, bad behavior in public spaces, prostitution, and excessive displays of grief at funerals, to family law, such as the rights of heiresses, the making of wills, inheritance, and duties in marriage, to land law, such as the shared use of public wells, the planting of trees, and boundaries, and finally to commercial law such as loans and exports. Solon made it illegal to not take care of your parents in old age, but gave exception to those who had not been taught a trade. This provided incentive for fathers to encourage their sons to find a trade. Solon even empowered the Council of the Areopagus to inquire into every man's means of supporting himself and to punish those who could show none, a dramatic contrast to the Spartan ethos that soldiering was the only appropriate work for a citizen. Like Draco, Solon feared the concentration of power in the hands of a few great families. It was probably for this reason that he allowed childless men, like himself, to adopt an heir by means of a will, thereby bypassing the traditional rule that such property passed automatically to the nearest male kin. His laws regarding sex and marriage reflect the traditional Greek view that a state was a conglomeration of oikoi. Although some of his laws seem intended to extend governmental power to cover women's private life, Solon's concerns about the excessive power of aristocratic families suggest that his more intrusive provisions, such as restrictions on women's dress, reflect his apprehension about conspicuous consumption by rich families, rather than a desire to control women's activities. Several of his policies, though, had a significant impact on women's lives. For example, the nearest male relative of a man who died without a son was required to marry the dead man's daughter. 
called an epicleros, in order to produce a male heir and thus keep the property in the family. A similar concern for maintaining the purity of family lines probably accounts for the fact that although Solon had abolished debt slavery and had forbidden fathers from selling their children into slavery, he made an exception for a man who discovered his unmarried daughter was not a virgin. The most characteristic and strange of all of Solon's laws is a stipulation that in the event of civil unrest in the city, every man had to side with a faction, otherwise he would lose his civil rights. It seems that Solon did not want a single citizen to be indifferent in public issues, or to seek only his own interests, or to take pride in the fact that the sufferings of his homeland caused him no pain. On the contrary, Solon wanted the citizen to take a position at the outset, alongside those he believed to be acting most correctly and justly, and to take a risk, and to help them instead of waiting safely to see who would win. Solon's legislation formed the backbone of later classical Athenian law, and is remarkable for its creativity and scope. Solon had been given an unusual opportunity to think long and hard about the nature of a community. His laws established the principle that the Athenian citizen body as a whole would guide the Athenian state. He essentially established the notion of citizenship itself. His law that neutrality was unacceptable in a time of civil strife demonstrates his determination that all male citizens take part in civic affairs, essentially defining a citizen as a person involved in public concerns. His laws also made clear that while the regulation of women's behavior was essential to a well-ordered society, their role was limited to the private sphere. Thus, he effectively excluded them from the political body. Solon defended his work in poetry, very few fragments of which survive. Decrying both the selfishness of the rich and the revolutionary demands of the poor, he identified wealth as an unstable and problematic force in human affairs. He writes, There are many bad rich men, while many good men are poor. He continues that he would not exchange his arete, or virtue, for the riches of the wealthy. For virtue endures, while wealth belongs now to one man, now to another. Although Solon urged justice for the people, he was also committed to defending the rights of the elite, both to their land and to a preeminent role in the government. As cited in Plutarch, Solon writes, I gave the demos such a privilege as is sufficient to them, neither adding nor taking away. And as for those who had power and were admired for their wealth, I also provided that they should not suffer undue wrong. I stood with a stout shield thrown over both parties, not allowing either one to prevail unjustly over the other. He also explicitly says that he had the opportunity to make himself tyrant, but pass it up and was ridiculed for doing so by the weak-minded. Just like the other sages, pithy maxims too have been attributed to Solon. Those being, learn to be ruled so that you may rule. Do not advise the pleasant, but the proper. Avoid pleasure, which then brings sadness. And finally, the older I become, the more I learn. While he is the first, fully fleshed out historical character that we may have seen, there are still so many things that remain uncertain. What is certain, however, is that he became a figure of enormous importance in the Athenian ideology. Plutarch remarks that Solon knew that in his efforts to please everyone, with his moderate legislation, he would not please anyone, and that there would be immediate efforts to overthrow it. So he made all agree to leave his laws unchanged for a hundred years, so that the effects could take place. He then made all archons swear that they would dedicate a gold statue at Delphi if they ever violated any of them. Furthermore, while these new laws were taking shape, Solon knew it would not have been safe for him to stay in Athens, so he surrendered his extraordinary authority and decided to leave Athens for 10 years. He knew very well that the Athenians, who swore to leave the laws unchanged, would try to induce him to repeal his own laws. As Solon was preparing for his self-imposed exile, he received a letter from his friend offering him the hospitality of Ionia. As it turned out, this letter recorded in the 3rd century AD by Diogenes Laertes, who wrote biographies of the philosophers, is one of only two pieces of writing to survive from Thales of Miletus, one of the most important thinkers of all time, and is commonly considered to be the first great philosopher in the Western tradition. Solon's first stop was Egypt, now under the rule of the pharaoh Apris, the son of Samtikos II. Herodotus reports that it was Amasis II, Apris's successor, but the chronology doesn't drive. In any event, 
Ever since Psammeticus I had enlisted Greek mercenaries to break the Assyrian stronghold on his kingdom, Egypt had maintained warm relations with the Greeks and often hosted Greek dignitaries at the royal palace at Sais. Solon was no exception, so a priest welcomed him as his honored guest. According to Plutarch, Solon spent some of his stay engaging in philosophical discussion with two prominent Egyptian priests, Senephus of Heliopolis and Sonchus of Sais, as well as sightseeing the great Egyptian monuments. According to Plato, Solon visited Neith's temple at Sais and received from the priests there an account of the history of Atlantis. Next, Solon sailed to Cyprus, which had spent the 7th century BC as an Assyrian vassal kingdom and only regained their independence upon its collapse. Cyprus's population was mainly Greek since Mycenaean times, with one notable Phoenician colony, and the ten kings who ruled the island were eager to restore their ties with the larger Greek world. It was in this spirit, sometime during the 580s BC, that they had welcomed Solon to their shores. During his visit, one of the kings, a man named Philocypris, requested that Solon design a new capital for him from scratch. So he took on the project, and the city that arose was later named Soloi, in his honor. After Cyprus, Solon sailed north and soon arrived at the shores of the Anatolian kingdom of Lydia, sometime around 585 BC. He was welcomed at the royal capital of Sardis by the Lydian king Aliates, and presumably by his young son, Croesus. In the wake of the Battle of the Halys River, Lydia sat at the crossroads between east and west, powerfully wealthy and at peace. It's perhaps in this context that we can set the apocryphal conversation between Solon and Croesus, given to us by Herodotus. Once again, Herodotus gets it wrong here. He has Croesus as the king, but the chronology once again doesn't jive. So if a conversation with Croesus actually happened, he was the crowned prince, not the king. In any event, with huge piles of gold, his future kingship assured, and no foreign threats on the horizon, the young prince was enthused that there could be no happier man than he in the entire world. But Solon, in an epic bout of warning on the fickleness of fortune, advised him that he should not count any man happy until he is dead. The reasoning was that at any minute, fortune might turn on even the happiest man and make his life miserable. This apocryphal conversation foreshadows future events. It was only later as king that Croesus would acknowledge the wisdom of Solon's advice. We will come back to this in a future episode. In any event, as we discussed in episode 19, it just so happens that Aesop was in Sardis, visiting Croesus as well. Some sources say that he assisted Solon on his journeys. At this point, we can presume that Solon made a final stop at Miletus before heading back to Athens where he probably discussed philosophy and politics with his friend Thales and may have been introduced to one of his most prominent young students, Anaximander. Plutarch records a conversation between Thales and Solon, in which Solon was astonished that his host was indifferent to marriage and having children. A few days later, a messenger arrived and told Solon that his son had died. A grieving Solon was then consoled by Thales, who told him that this is the reason he didn't want to have children. This story is most likely anecdotal. In any event, while Solon was off traveling abroad, political strife broke out again back at Athens. Although Solon's reforms eased social tensions in Attica, by intensifying the competition for political office though, he either completely failed to eliminate, if it was there previously, or indirectly fostered the civil strife that would soon follow. Within about four years after Solon had left Athens, in either 591 or 590 BC, there was so much political strife that they were unable to elect the nine archons, meaning there was a period of anarchia, anarchy, as those in the office clung to their positions and refused to step down. Eventually it was restored, however, but occurred again in 586 or 585 BC until it was once again restored. The specific details of the tumultuous decade of the 580s BC are unclear, but we do know that in either 582 or 581 BC, Damasius became archon and refused to step down from the position at the end of his term, and thus he remained in office for two years and two months before being driven out of Athens in 579 BC. During his time in office, Damasius is notable for naming the seven sages of Greece. In any event, 
it's clear that he wanted to make himself tyrant. Afterwards, some sort of board of governors in the form of 10 archons were appointed for the next 10 months. Five from the Eupatridae, three from the Agroikoi, or farmers, and two from the Demiorgoi, or the artisans, in order to fill out his term. This probably reflects a concession that was forced upon the Eupatridae by the politically ambitious non-aristocrats. This experiment was quickly abandoned, and the following year, in 579-578 BC, the three traditional offices of the Archons was reinstituted. There was clearly some kind of political upheaval in the works. The form it took was of regional factions. The important families of the aristocracy each sought to make themselves a dominant force and bring about changes to the constitution. There were three factions, and they are categorized by their regions. Historians still debate the composition of each group. The first group, though, the people in the middle part of Attica, were called the Petty Oikoi, or the Men of the Plain. Their leader was Lycurgus, and numbered among them was the clan of the Phaeidae. Notable among them was Hippoclides, the infamous wooer of Agoristi. The Petty Oikoi owned the best land, where the grain and wheat grew, so they derived their wealth from agricultural production, and thus were the richest. Naturally, they represented the traditional aristocratic ideals and wanted to undo Solon's laws. With the expulsion of the Alcmeonidae, they came to dominate Athenian politics without much competition. Secondly, the people from the southern tip of Attica, from Cape Sunio on the southwest to the southeast, called Peralia, were called the Peralioi, or the men of the coast. They had been led by the Alcmeonidae, and their leader was Megacles the son of Alcmeon, and the grandson of the Megacles that had slain Chilon. He married Agoristi. These people were the newly wealthy, from commerce, so they were fishermen, craftsmen, and shipbuilders. And they wanted a moderate constitution, similar to Solon's laws. Third, the people in the east coast of Attica, called Diacrea, which is separated from central Attica by a mountain range, were called the Diacreoi, or the men of the hills. They were sometimes referred to as hyperacreoi, or the men beyond the hills. They were the poorest, earning what they could by trading wool and honey. Perhaps the city dwellers were in this last group as well. In any event, they were the most radical, representing the views of the demos. Their leader was Pisistratus. His family was from Brauron, on the east coast of Attica, and the main bulk of his supporters would have come from that region and the northeast. Following Solon's reforms, all three factions had equal power and equal ambitions, making the political system in Athens very unstable. When Solon pulled into Phaleron Harbor, the predecessor of the later port of Piraeus, either in 583 or 580 BC, he found the city much changed. There was so much more energy, as reflected by the many civic projects, and his reforms brought Athens several decades of economic stability, growth, and prosperity. In fact, by 575 BC, a great stone ramp had been driven up to the Acropolis that overlooked the city. The construction of new buildings and statues, funded by the great Athenian families, turned the Acropolis into a shrine as magnificent as any other in Greece, such as the Temple of Athenopolis, the precursor to the Parthenon that housed the cult statue of the goddess that was rumored to have fallen from the sky, and a statue of Athena Promachois. At the same time, Local pottery styles gave way to the widespread adoption of Athenian black figure style, which soon expanded to incorporate imagery tailored to specific markets. And thus, this Athenian style began to be exploited in ever increasing numbers, and soon eclipsed Corinthian pottery as the standard in the Aegean. The Athenians also instituted their own great festival, the Great Panathenia, or the Panathenaic Games, in 566 BC. It was established under the archonship of our good friend Hippocleides and was modeled on the Olympic Games. The games were divided into games for Athenians only and games for Athenians and any other Greeks who wanted to participate. The athletic events were the same as the other athletic games, but instead of the stadion, the chariot race was the most prestigious event. Another form of chariot racing at the Panathenaic Games was known as the Apobatai, in which the contestants wore armor and periodically leapt off of a moving chariot and ran alongside it before leaping back on again. In these races, there was a second charioteer, a rain holder, while the Apobates jumped out. 
In the catalogs with the winners, both the names of the Apobates and of the Rain Holder are mentioned. Images of this contest show warriors, armed with helmets and shields, perched on the back of their racing chariots. Some scholars believe that the event preserved traditions of Homeric warfare. But these new games also featured musical and poetic competitions, which were also part of the Pythian games. Prizes were rewarded for rhapsodic recitation of the Homeric poems, for instrumental music on the Aeolus and Cathara, and for singing to the accompaniment of said instruments. In addition, the games included a reading of both the Odyssey and the Iliad. It culminated on the eighth day in a great procession that carried a peplos, or robe, woven to Athena by young Athenian maidens to our temple in the Acropolis. There was also a large sacrifice made to Athena, the Hecatomb, or a sacrifice of a hundred oxen, and the meat from the sacrificed animals was used in an enormous banquet on the final night of the festival, called the Panicus, or All-Nighter. Award ceremonies included the giving of Panathenaic amphorae that contained olive oil, which was much sought after and precious in antiquity. The winner of the four-horse chariot race in particular was given 140 amphorae of olive oil. Although Athens was receiving a cultural facelift, there still was political unrest, as Athens was still dominated by the noble families. The primary cause of the political unrest was the personal ambition and rivalry of the aristocratic faction leaders, Lycurgus, Megacles, and Pisistratus, in their struggle for political domination. Aristotle reports that the post of eponymous archon was the battleground for the competing aristocrats in the period following Solon's reforms, which is what ultimately led to the period of anarchy mentioned earlier. Following his return to Athens, Solon tried to act as a mediator between the heads of all three. He was revered and honored by all due to his reputation, but age was catching up to him and he no longer had the strength or fervor for public service. Thus, going into political retirement, Solon had to seek contentment in the fact that he did his best to instill justice in his polis, but beyond that, he could only put his faith in his fellow citizens that the city would continue to prosper and resist the threat and temptation of tyranny. However, those philosophical ideals didn't resonate with the rest of his family. Solon quickly detected the ambitions of his cousin, Pisistratus. He tried to soften and mold him by his instructions, but to no avail. Because by the late 560s BC, Pisistratus had decided that he, as tyrant, would offer the best hope of political stability for Athens, and the elder Solon helplessly was forced to watch as the situation spiraled further and further out of control. So join us next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 26, The Tyranny of the Pisistratids. If you haven't done so yet, please head on over to iTunes and rate and review the show. It would help the podcast grow immensely. Also, while you're there, Subscribe to the show so it comes onto your phone or a listening device every week. If you don't have iTunes, you can catch the show on SoundCloud, Stitcher, or Google Play. Also, make sure you're checking out the website at thehistoryofancientgreece.com, where I've posted a lot of neat supplementary photos, maps, and charts for each episode. Finally, now that the show has gained some traction, I decided to create a Patreon page in case anyone felt inclined to contribute to the creation of the History of Ancient Greece podcast. There's a link on the right-hand side of the website. But don't worry, the podcast will still remain free regardless. But it is an expensive endeavor to create a podcast after all, with the cost of website hosting and the purchasing of equipment and the time and effort required to research, write, record, and edit a show. So if you're feeling generous, consider supporting the show by making a monthly donation. If you'd rather just do a one-time donation, there's also a PayPal link on the right-hand side of the website. Just click on the Donate button. Patreon allows you to pledge money for every episode or per month. It can be as little as a dollar a month if you please. That amounts to a soda, tea, or cup of coffee a month. And while it may seem insignificant, if many people pledge that amount, it can really add up quickly. Either way, I would be eternally grateful. I would like to give a thanks to listener Al Ozanoff for his pledge. I am eternally grateful for your support. And once again, thanks everyone for your continued support, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I would like to give a special thanks to the amazing artist Michael Levy for allowing me to feature his music on this podcast. He transports you to the ancient world, bringing to life the melodies and using the techniques of the past. A new song will be played every episode. This one is titled Magic of the Ancients from his album 
Apollo's Lyre. If you like what you heard and are curious to learn more about ancient Greek music, check out his website at ancientlyre.com. His albums are available in every major digital music store, including iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify.